Good morning and welcome to Coffee and Prayer. I'm Pastor Andrew F. Carter and it is 5.30 here in Inglewood, California. As you guys are tuning in, please let me know where you are and what time it is. If you're on the podcast or maybe you're watching it a little later, we love you guys, we honor you, and we appreciate you guys spending time with us uh, when you've got time to do so. Uh, So check it out. Today we are jumping into the book of Jude. We are one chapter away from the book of Revelations and completing the entire New Testament. And um, as we've talked about before, I believe there's 21 or 22 chapters in Revelation, but we'll be uh, starting right back over in Matthew uh, with, um, let me see, let me double check, let me double check before I lose my train of thought. We've got 22 chapters in Revelation, but we'll be starting right back in Matthew with a different translation. So um, we've got people from all around the world, Uh, Ohio, Wisconsin, Santa Ana, L.A., Long Island, New Jersey, Virginia, KC. There we go. There's There's our devotions for the day. If anybody comes in and is like, hey, what are we doing? Jude and Genesis 43. We've got India in the house, Germany. Fresno, California, Seattle, all over, man. It's it's a beautiful, beautiful thing. Um, I'm honored, absolutely honored, thankful, grateful, um, and, and just privileged, absolutely privileged to be here with you guys this morning. Um, I'm tired. I want to share that, and I and I'm sharing, and not and let me be honest. Let me let me say something, right? I, I know that there's power in my words. Um, I know that there, there, there's the things that we speak are of the utmost importance. I'm not tired in the sense of like, I'm tired of my calling. I'm tired of doing what I'm doing. I'm tired because I had a game last night uh, and, and we get, and I still get up regardless of my feelings or my emotions. Um, and I'm excited for what, what God's doing in our ministry, in our lives. But um, at the end of the day, if you don't get enough sleep, something happens, uh, we're not getting enough rest, you become tired. But it's it's cool because coming here is energizing. Showing up here in the morning is energizing. And again, I'm not tired because I'm doing anything. I'm tired because I'm choosing to play sports that I like to do that really fills my cup. So it's like this double-edged sword. It's my choice to be in the basketball league that I'm in, and it runs the risk of having games at nine o'clock at night. And so if my game's at nine, I don't finish till 10, and I drive 45 minutes home, I don't get home until 10.45 and in bed by 11.30, I know the risk. But what I'm saying, I'm saying all of this, right? Is there are consequences for your actions and your decisions that you have to deal with. You have to weigh out the pros and cons. And sometimes there's choices and decisions that you have to make. Uh, and, and the consequence might be dire. It might be challenging. And, and before I make that decision, I weigh it out. And I was like, you know what? If I'm a little tired on Tuesday because I had a late Monday night game, it's worth it. Right, the the little bit of sleep sacrifice for doing something that I absolutely love is worth it because I'm not gonna miss coffee and prayer. So it's it's weighing out these two things that I love. Do I love basketball? Yes. Do I love coffee and prayer? Yes. Uh, do I love sleep? Absolutely. But one of them are going to suffer in one of those areas, and it's the same thing, right? Do you love the world or do you love the word? Do you love serving God or do you love serving yourself? What is more important to you? A lot of people will say with their mouth that they love God, but won't make the sacrifices necessary to truly serve him. Let me say that again. A lot of people will say with their mouth, they'll outwardly express that they love God. But knowing the scripture says, if you love God, you'll obey him. So people will say with their mouth that they love God, but won't make the sacrifices necessary to show with their actions that they're truly serving him. Amen. To know that we're truly, truly serving him. Mm, That's good. That's good. The way you live your life, does it line up with scripture? Right? Or are you deliberately living in sin? I had a brother reach out to me yesterday and um, you know, he's he's asking about advice and 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 you know, just giving me kind of a breakdown of his life and, and what you know, some of the things that I said, I spoke truthfully, I spoke plainly, as I usually do. I, I like to keep it real. I, I don't like to beat around the bush. But I said, Hey, you're you're blatantly you're blatantly living in sin. And he's like, Well, I wouldn't say blatantly. 
I absolutely would say blatantly because you are living in sin and you know that it's a sin, but are choosing to ignore that because it's not as bad. You've created this hierarchy or this priority, right? It's sin, but it's not as bad. I know other people who are doing worse. We get into this comparison game, right? It's sin, but it's not like their sin, right? It's sin, but it's not as bad as this person's sin. Look, man, sin is sin regardless of how you want to package it. And it is blatant regardless of whether you want to acknowledge it or not. What we like to do is twist and manipulate the scripture to fit our own agendas and to fit our own goals and lifestyles. But I'm here to tell you that the scripture, uh, serving God, following him, it's not a buffet line. It's not like going to Subway. You can't pick and choose the different parts that you want to follow. You don't don't get to walk around and create the sandwich of your dreams when it comes to scripture. You don't get to choose which uh, which things you follow and which things you don't. Right? It, it, it's a total package. It, it's a it's one thing combined. You come it comes together, man, and it, you get what you get. And if what you're doing is in opposition of the scripture, what has to change? You or the scripture? It's you. It's you. The sin is sin. And it's blatant when you know that it is, but you choose to ignore it. We'll we'll say, well, I want a deeper, better relationship with God. I want to go further. I want to go deeper. I want to know him more. But then we refuse to listen and to follow. And and we abuse the grace thinking, well, well, he'll forgive me for these little things. But it's, that's not the point. That's not how it works. It's not like Subway. We have to get to this place where, you know, we're willing to sacrifice and lay down our own lives for what's right uh, and to head in the direction that God's calling us. We'll say with our mouths that we love the Lord, but our lives and our actions say the opposite. Amen. I want to say a prayer before we get started and um, then we'll get going from there. So Heavenly Father, we just thank you for your love, your mercy, and your grace. God, your forgiveness that speaks volumes, your, your, your love that knows no bounds. It's limitless. It's unconditional. Uh, and, and your mercy. You don't punish us as we are deserving. You don't give us or allow us to pay the penalty or the price of our sin. You sent your son Jesus to make the payment in full. And Lord, we come here with a heart filled with gratitude, appreciation. Uh, we come here with a, a heart filled with thankfulness. We, we love you, Lord, and are, are honored that you would lay uh, your own son's life down on the line so that we can have relationship with you, so that we can have fellowship with you. God, in, right now in this moment, we just pray that you would challenge us, that you would change our hearts, that you would transform us. We know that true transformation comes from your presence, from being with you. It comes from spending time in your word. It comes from uh, sharpening ourselves with other brothers and sisters in Christ, fellowshipping with other believers. So God, as we draw near to you and we're in this place, we pray that just your presence, just the hem of your garment is enough to heal us. God, confront any area of our life that needs work, reveal to us the areas that you want us to spend time uh, growing in. Lord, expose us, peel back the layers, uh, shine light in the darkness, uh, pull out the skeletons from our closet, God. Help us to be real so that we can heal. Help us to know you more, to be intimate as we sit in this place pursuing your word, seeking your word, searching your word, wanting to know better so that we can do better. God, change our lives and let the fruit of our labor, let the fruit of uh, the, the, the fruits of our lives um, be loud. Let the fruits of our lives be evident. May people see the works and may people see the way that we live and be drawn to us like a moth is drawn to the light so that we can introduce them to Jesus and they can experience the same transformational power and love that we are so honored and blessed to share in. And we pray this in the mighty name of Jesus Christ. Amen and amen. I remember when uh, somebody asked if we could pray before going in. We spent months doing coffee and prayer without praying in. And I don't think that that was wrong. Uh, but, but somebody said, man, I can only make 30 minutes I can only do 30 minutes and um, I'm, I really like the praying part. Can we pray before we start? And it was just like, absolutely. 
Um, I love that too. I, I really enjoy praying in uh, because sometimes, let's say you got to get out of here early. That might be the only prayer, you know, that might be the, the only time you get to pray with us. And so I think it's powerful and I think it's definitely changed the dynamic of what we do here. Um, <laughs> it's funny. I got tired voice right now. I can hear myself. I'm like, bro, you sound like Morgan Freeman. <clears throat> Clear your throat, drink some coffee and start and start talking normal. I'm over here talking like like I'm narrating uh, the Bible. It's It's insane. Oh, that's better. <clears throat> well, yeah, it was seven years and four scores ago when we started reading the Bible. Well, let's get into it. We got Jude, the book of Jude. So, hey, check it out. This is Jesus' other half-brother. He jumps in and says, hey, from Jude, a servant of Jesus Christ and a brother of James. We understand that the book of James was written by Jesus' half-brother. Uh, this is James's brother. Therefore, he also would be James's half brother. Let me answer this question. Somebody asked, how many hats do you have? I don't know. I have a lot of hats. I I, I do. Uh, the cool thing is, is my, my brothers at uh, Lifted Lifestyle, um, they sent me about five or six hats. Uh, this is from Brian Barcelona's book that he wrote. Uh, it's called Keep Scrolling. He sent me one of these hats with his book. Uh, my brother Gonzo Gonzalo, the found sheep, he's given me like four or five hats or so. Uh, I got my people over at Malta Apparel. They, people give me hats. They give me shirts. I got a lot of free stuff. Um, glory to God. I haven't had to buy a hat or buy a shirt in months. Uh, oh, years. Excuse me. Years. I haven't had to, I haven't had to buy a hat or shirt in years. Um, and if you guys are ever wondering where I get the stuff at, they're usually tagged in the post or they're usually commenting on the post. So if you guys are interested in that stuff, go check them out. Go check their pages out. Uh, I think that it's really, I think that it's really cool that, um, these are great pieces to start conversations with individuals. It's a great piece to get you a dirty look too, especially during pride month as I'm walking around with my Jesus saves fam, uh, hat and my, and, and my God is dope stuff, whatever stuff that I'm wearing, you know, you see people they'll, I mean, they're just anti-Christian. They think that we're hateful. They think that we're bigoted. They think that, uh, you know, we're, we're intolerant. Um, and we are, we hate sin. We're, we're, we're intolerant against sin. Uh, we're, we're not fans of that and not just that sin, but all sin. I hold my straight brothers to the same standard that I hold anybody to. Like, uh, regardless of your sin, I got the same stance on adultery and, and uh, the same stance on, on murder and, 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 and violence and uh, all of that stuff. My stance stays the same, man, against all sin. You know what I mean? It's wild. So yeah, I love these hats. I love these conversation starters. They're, they're great pieces. Um, because I've had a chance, I've given hats away while I was out. People, oh, I love your hat. Here, you can have it. Let's talk about it. And um, I think it's a great way to evangelize. Anyway, so James, uh, who wrote the book of James, is Jesus' half-brother. And we find that Jude is too. I love this because who is he writing to? It says, to all who have been called by God. This is a letter to all who have been called. This is a great warning. This, this letter is a warning to believers and, and kind of like this reassurance that, hey man, sinners are going to be punished. God will punish the sinners according to his will. He is fair. He is just. He is righteous. Nobody slips through the cracks. Anybody who is not saved will receive the punishment that is due them. Uh, he goes into a little bit of detail. He's like, um, I want to encourage you to fight hard for the faith. That was given the holy people of God once and for all. I love this, this encouraging to fight hard for the faith. Fight hard. Uh, I've shared recently that I know that God has given me this city. That he has appointed me to this territory. Inglewood is a territory that he's put me in charge of. And after church, I had lots of people come up and they prayed for me and I prayed for people. But there was just a lot of confirmation saying that the fighter spirit that's in me, because I've fought a lot, not like physically fighting, but uh, have overcome a lot of things. And the experiences and the things that I've gone through uh, definitely make me a great candidate to be in charge of a place like Inglewood. Uh, I'm a great representative and ambassador of Jesus because the people who are here are people who have gone through similar trials, tribulations 
situations and obstacles that I've experienced. And it's a beautiful thing. But one of the other things that they said is that uh, in order to take this territory, it's going to be a fight. Right. The powers and principalities and dark places understand that this is a spiritual war. Many of us wake up and forget that we are in the middle of a war. Many of us wake up and all we can do is focus on our suffering, our circumstances and the things that we're going through, not remembering or realizing that you are waking up in a battlefield. Right. When you open your eyes, you are waking up in a battlefield. You are surrounded by powers and principalities in the spiritual realm that hate your soul. They want to render you useless. They want to render you, uh, you know, ineffective. They want to, they want to come against your identity in Christ. They want you to forget who you are. These spiritual principalities want to remind you of who you were. They want to remind you of your mistakes. They come with shame. They come with guilt. They come with insecurity. They come with anxiousness. They come with depression. They come with heartache. They come against your family. These things, these spiritual powers and principalities are trying to take your focus off of your purpose. They're trying to distract you. When you open your eyes, there is a war that is being waged against you, your family, your loved ones, and all of the people in your sphere of influence. And many of us will wake up and rub the stuff out of our eyes and jump right on our phone and we will, uh, and not on your phone to be on coffee and prayer, but you'll jump right on your phone and you'll start bombarding yourselves with images and ideas and philosophies and the wisdom of this world. You'll immediately become distracted. You'll be reminded, you'll wake up and check your bank account only to be reminded that there ain't enough, right? You'll, you'll jump on immediately to tech your te- check your text messages to realize that you're in conflict and there's turmoil turmoil with your loved ones. We'll jump right on our phone and we'll check our emails just to realize that there's another bill. There's more bad news. There's something going on, not knowing that these are strategies of, and tactics of the enemy looking to pull your attention off of Jesus and what he has called you to. So if you want to be victorious, you have to wake up, remind yourself of who you are, remind yourself of where you are, and you're going to have to fight. You're going to have to fight. He says, I want to encourage you to fight hard for the faith. Wake up and fight. We can't keep being distracted. We can't keep allowing our our feelings and our emotions and all of the things that we are experiencing here in this place to continue to pull at our, uh, our focus. We have to stay focused. We have to be ready to fight. I believe that this ministry is a ministry filled with fighters. One of the things that I love about Royal City Church, uh, the online community, the in-person community, is I look, man, I sit there. And you know how in some areas and regions, man, you got you got churches that are primarily black people. You got churches that are primarily Hispanic. You got churches that are primarily old people. The one thing that I love and absolutely cherish Um, is that our community is so diverse. I've got people who are young in their teens who follow along, man, who are on fire for Jesus. And I have people who are older. I have people from different, different races and ethnicities and cultures and backgrounds and countries and experiences and socioeconomic status, right? We've got people who are uh, mega rich. We've got people who are, are in the gutters and, and poor and like, you know, we've just got people from everywhere. And it's this beautiful picture of individuals who are fighting and we're heading in the same direction. God has rallied us here. There's 460 people on this live right now. Different people from different places. It's not a coincidence. It's not an accident. It's it's not a mistake that we're all in this place hearing the same word, heading in the same direction. And this is our battle cry, man. Our battle cry is, is, is like, Jesus, we're here, send us. Jesus, we're here, use us. Jesus, we're here, we want more. Jesus, we're here, we want better. Jesus, we're here, change and transform us. Our battle cry is Jesus, we're here and we're ready to fight. We're ready to fight for what is right. We're ready to fight for the truth. We're ready to fight for holiness and the pursuit of righteousness. Lord, we're ready to fight against sin. We're here to, we're ready to fight with truth and with love. Man, it's a beautiful thing. 
And, and because it's a fight, we've got all of these people from different places and different regions and countries, different ethnicities and backgrounds. And, and we look different, but the same Holy Spirit that's in me is the same Holy Spirit that's in you. And God is equipping us. He's, he's readying us. We're being filled with the word. And then he's sending us out in our different positions and places, wherever it is that you're watching this. He's sending us out to be a light. And as we're filled with the light, we're filled with uh, the Holy Spirit, we're going out like heat-seeking missiles and we're making an impact in this world. Yesterday, I saw the fruits of some of uh, the things that we're doing. And even over the weekend, my kids are here. And, you know, uh, it's weird because I'm playing a lot of basketball right now. I keep talking about it. You're like, okay, Andrew, we get it. You like to play. I'm going to tell you this. I'm not even that good. I'm not that great of a basketball player, but God is putting me in these places and I'm being sought after, not because of my amazing skill with the ball or shooting. It's because I'm a great team player, right? I know my role and I play it really well. I, I tell people that I am the best basketball player in this area who plays their role. There's nobody better at playing their role than me. I get back on defense every time. I love to pass the basketball. I love to I love to get offensive rebounds. I love to set picks. Right? I love to set my teammates up for success. I try not to force a lot of bad shots because I know my role. I know my limitations. I'm by far many times on my, on my team, I'm the oldest guy on the team, yet I usually play the most minutes. I play a lot of the minutes because I hustle. I, I, it's not because of this amazing skill or this amazing talent. It's because there's a fight and a fire inside of me. And I'm able to keep up with these guys who are younger than me. I'm able to run and I'm able to battle and I'm able to put a body on them. I'm ready, I'm ready to box out. I'm, I'm ready to play a physical game for 40 minutes. I'm there every day. I show up on time. I get warmed up. You see my old self, you know, warming up before the game, stretching my hamstrings, stretching my calves. I, I'm there. I'm, I'm being put in these places, not because of anything, but I believe it's because God wants me in these places. And I say that because there's guys who are better shooters. There's guys who are faster. They can jump better. They can dribble better. There's so many guys who are so much greater, but I'm being put in these places for a purpose. And what I'm seeing is as I'm there, I'm developing friendships and relationships and I'm being a light in individuals' lives who might not have been reached before this. It's not just about me getting great exercise, but God is using me even in the places. A ref said last night, because I fouled the guy and I put my hand up, no argument, I'm not, dis, you know, I'm not disputing the call, I fouled the guy. And the natural response for 99.9% .9 of athletes is, I didn't foul him. I didn't touch him. It wasn't me. But even in the game of basketball, I try to use, or I, I use integrity. So I fouled the guy. It was blatant. I put my hand up. I didn't complain. And as the ref was shooting, he goes, why can't you guys be more like him? That's what he said. Why can't you guys be more like him? He doesn't complain. If he fouls, he raises his hand. He's got a smile on his face. He's just happy to be here. And I said, well, I'm filled with the Holy Spirit, sir. And it's because I love Jesus and I'm playing this game in front of him. And he goes, ah, that's what it is. And I was like, yes, even on the basketball court. And look, don't bring up the fact that I might have gotten to an argument a few weeks ago because God's redeemed that. Even in the middle of a game, God is able to use me and minister. And as he said that, and as a chance, and when I spoke about the Holy Spirit and being filled with the joy and the light of Jesus, the guy was shooting a free throw and there was six men around around me and they all heard me testify and give glory to God, to give glory to the Holy Spirit. And, and as, as this man's pointing at, at me as an example, I said, I'm only an example because of the Holy Spirit, because of Jesus. So even in the middle of a basketball game, God is able to use you in the place that you're at. Isn't that amazing? Like, think about that. Many of us complain about the place that we're at. Many of us will uh, will gripe and will get upset because of things aren't going our way. But even in the middle of hobbies, in the middle of turmoil, in the middle of storms, in the middle of uh, wherever you're at, man, God's able to use you. It's wild. That was a fruit of the labor and 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 just of the hard work, man. Just fighting the fight. And something as simple as just being present and in the moment and having integrity in what you're doing, even in those places, that's a form of worship. Moving forward, uh, you know, this is a this is in Jude, it's a stark warning against what's going on. It says some people have secretly entered your group. 
Long ago, the prophets wrote about these people who will be judged guilty. They are against God and have changed the grace of our God into a reason for sexual sin. And now he goes into reminding, he's like, hey, do you remember when the Lord saved his people by bringing them out of Egypt? But he destroyed all who did not believe, right? And even the angels who, who, uh, who did not keep their place of power, but left their proper home. The Lord has kept these angels in darkness. Sodom and Gomorrah, the same way. They suffer uh, the punishment of eternal fire as an example for all to see. Even Michael, when he argued with the devil, uh, he didn't dare to judge the devil guilty. Instead, he said, the Lord punish you. Right? Verse 10, it says, but people, but these people who are amongst you, right? The people who have entered your group, it says, but these people speak against things they don't understand. And what they do know by feeling as dumb animals know things and are the very things that destroy them. It will be terrible for them because they have followed the way of Cain. They surely will be destroyed, right? They eat with you and have no fear caring only for themselves. It says that there is a place in the blackest darkness that has been kept for them forever. I want to rewind and just in, chapter, in verse 10, it says, but these people speak things, they speak against things they don't understand. And what they do know by feeling as dumb animals know things are the very things that destroy them. This jumped off the page for me, right? By feelings like dumb animals. And I was like, time out, man. Did he just say that these people are, that, that, that feelings, that animals live based off of feeling? And so I started sitting there praying about it and thinking about it. And I was like, man, you know, animals, that carnal instinct, right? That carnal instinct to be moved by feelings is like a dumb animal. It's like a dumb animal. So as an animal is eating, it uses its feelings and, and this internal, this instinct to keep itself alive. It's moved. Animals are moved by feeling. So you hear me talk about, hey, I'm, I want to be moved by faith, not feeling. I want, I want, I don't want to, I don't want to make decisions based and ruled off of feelings and emotions. I want them to be grounded in truth. I want them to be rooted in the spirit. I want to make sure that I'm responding and not reacting. And it, the way that he just says they are moved by feeling as dumb animals know things and they're the very things that destroy them. I think that it adds this emphasis that. So many people will come to me and say, Andrew, well, I, I don't feel like God hears me. I don't feel like God's listening to me. I don't feel like God's with me. I don't feel like God uh, uh, loves me. I don't feel like God wants what's best for me. I don't feel like God will forgive me. And it's this feeling word. It's the F word, right? Feeling is the F word. Feelings aren't all evil, right? We all have feelings. We all have emotions. But when you are moving your life by the F word, when you're living your life by the F word, which is feelings, you're going to be led astray. You guys get that? A feeling isn't always accurate. Too many people are going off their gut instinct and not their God instinct. Let me say that again. That's a tweet if you don't know. Too many people are going off their gut instinct and not their God instinct. Too many people are allowing their feelings to dictate their actions and not their faith. They're being moved by every situation. But the truth of the matter is that we need the truth of the matter to help us to make our choices and decisions, right? You, you, can, you have all of these examples of, oh, I don't feel like God's with me. Well, what's the truth say? The truth says in Deuteronomy 31, 6 and 8 that God will never leave you nor forsake you. So if you feel lonely or if you feel like God's not with you, you run to truth. And as you stand on truth, you understand that your feelings are leading you astray. Because if you listen to your feelings about loneliness and God not being with you and you start making choices from that place of hurt and abandonment, the choices and decisions that you're going to make are going to lead you in a direction where you're looking for validation, identity, and worth from this world. And the world doesn't serve up the truth. The world serves up things that are counterfeit. So now, because you feel lonely and alone, like, uh, like God's not with you and you feel, you feel, you feel, you start making choices out of that hurt and out of that trauma. And when you're making choices out of feelings, hurt and trauma, now you are running to the world. And rather than feeling the God, uh, the God sized 
whole in your heart with him, you're filling it with the things of this world only to become more empty, more numb, more hurt, more lonely, more broken. Now you've got shame. Now you've got guilt. And you start this, this, this hamster wheel of chasing after your feelings and your emotions when the first thing we should do is run to the truth in order to establish some ground rules, some ground, like, like get grounded, establish a foundation, uh, get yourself anchored in the truth. Feelings are fleeing. Man, one minute my stomach, I could, I could feel sick. I can feel tired. I can feel hungry. I can feel alone. I can feel sad. I can feel happy. And only three minutes has gone by. So if I'm making decisions and choices by my feelings, which is a roller coaster, right? If my, my feelings can be a roller coaster. If that's how I'm making choices and decisions in my life, especially about important things, what do you think the fruit of my life is going to look like? It's, it's, it's going to be a roller coaster because everything that moves me, everything that touches me, everything that, uh, you know, I get a gut feeling about, I'm making this reactive response to, and uh, it's leading me astray. And God's walking behind trying to pick up the pieces like, man, if you would focus, if you would have faith and you would start making choices and decisions that are rational from the spirit that are based in truth. Uh, I don't got to come around picking up all of the mess that you're making because you're running around like a chicken with his head cut off, making all these decisions from a place of hurt, from a place of feeling and emotion. And now you're, you're so far off track that you don't even know where you're at. Amen. Listen, I got to ask a question right now. <clears throat> I see a lot of the same names, but new profile pics. Were we supposed to change our profile picture and nobody told me? My Lord, man, my friends out here, you know, when, when, uh, when you've been on here for a while, right? 242 days in a row, you start recognizing names and, and, and faces. And, uh, apparently I guess some of y'all decided to go out and change your profile picture because I'm seeing names with different faces. What is going on? Is it time for me to change I get, I need to get the message here. Like I'm I'm like, Bob, Vicky, I see some of y'all. You guys don't think I noticed that stuff? I notice, I notice. Okay. Don't be surprised if tomorrow I pop up with a different little profile picture. Come on, somebody. <laughs> that is funny. I didn't get the memo either. Someone said, no, don't. <laughs> Calm down. It's not that serious. It's a profile picture. My account will be the same. Just a little face. You know what that's going to do? That's going to throw the scammers for a run too. They're going to be sick about it because they're going to be reaching out, trying to get you to donate to the orphanage with the same old profile pic and it's going to be different. We won't tell them. They might be on here though, right now listening. They're going to be like, oh buddy, where we cannot wait for you to change it because we've already got a profile ready to fake people out. And I want to touch on that for just a second. You guys, please, 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 please. You sending me, and I love, I know that you're well-meaning. You sending me that doesn't, I can't do anything about it. I know about it. There will always be fake pages. They will always be asking you for money. They will always have a word for you. They will always have an orphanage for you to donate to. I will never, mark my words, never create a separate account, look you up, friend request you, and slide into your DMs. It's not going to happen, right? It is not an answer from God. It is not a miracle. It is not something that's miraculously happening. Uh, you have not been chosen. This, that's not going to happen. Please use spiritual discernment. The reason why I say don't even share it with me, because they block me. So I can't look them up. I can't search them. I cannot find them. I cannot report them. And Instagram won't do anything about it. So the best thing that you could do, please hear me. And my wife's too, because they do it with hers too, is report them as somebody that you know, uh, that they're, they're impersonating somebody that you know, and then block them. That's the best thing that you could do. Report them and then block them. Uh, unfortunately, it is a scam that's going around. People are like, look, this, and they, they'll, they'll send me the info and it says user not found. You know what that means? Because they're smart. They block me because if I, if I report them and say, Hey, they're impersonating me then Instagram takes them down. But if I'm blocked, I can't report them. Amen. But please, please get this rooted. This is truth. This is gospel. This is, this is the gospel of Andrew. I'm telling you now, 
I will never make another account and neither will my wife. And we will never digitally panhandle you or ask you to be a part of our orphanage in another country. Um, and if we did, it would be from this account. I do not have two accounts. I will never have another one. And if you didn't know right now, it's dude's day. My brother, <laughs> my brother said, uh, my brother Bob said, it's dude's day. If you don't know, it's dude's day. And that's where I'm going to get back to Jude. But please, you guys use discernment. I got people out here screaming at me. I just donated and you keep asking me for money. And I'm like, I've never asked you for money. Yes, I donated to your orphanage. And I'm like, bro, I don't have an orphanage. You've been scammed. No, but you messaged me from your other account. It's like, oh. Lord Jesus, help my brothers and sisters to be discerning, to test every spirit, test those spirits. Moving forward, um, last part of Jude. Ooh, it's good stuff. A warning and things to do, man. Uh, in verse 18, it says, they said to you in the last times, there will be people who laugh about God following their own evil desires, which are against God. Somebody asked me, they said, Andrew, with scripture, how can you tell me that we're in the last times? Bro, we've been in the last time since Jesus uh, went to heaven. See, what we do is we get we we get so caught up with time, right? It says in the scripture that a thousand years is like a day to the Lord and a day to the Lord is like a thousand years to us. So we're not under his timing. Uh, the, the last days are around us. Good is considered bad. Bad is considered good. We're in this place where people mock us. There's persecution like we have been in the last days. Do you guys get that? Like we've been there. And, and it's, it's, it, there's multiple verses that talk about it, that the, that there's going to be floods and natural disasters and there's going to be disease and pestilence and famine and wars and there's going to be all of these things. It's going to be the signs of the end and we have seen these for years and years and years. There should be this sense of urgency that is rooted in your heart. Understand the Holy Spirit. Does anybody else, can any of you guys feel this? Right. Nobody knows the day or the time, but the Holy Spirit in us confirms it doesn't take a rocket scientist or a theologian. I can feel it in my innermost being that we are near. Now, what does near mean? Near could be a hundred years. But that's still very near. It could be a hundred days. That's still very near. It could be a thousand years. That's still really near. And what, even if it's a thousand years and I don't see it in my lifetime, the way that I live my life dictates the way that those who come after me live their life. We talk about legacy all the time. Uh, we're, as we're reading about Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and the way that things are going. And now Joseph, as we're going to get into chapter 43 of Genesis, we understand that legacy is passed down the way that the ones who lived before you is passed down to those who come after you. I understand that I come from a long line and a, and a large family tree of those who struggled with addiction and immorality and poverty and violence and all of these things. And at some point, somebody has to make a stand and say enough is enough. They have to break the generational curses and say, look, as for me and my family, we're going to serve the Lord. Somebody needs to step in and be the one who puts their faith in Jesus. And I decided that's going to be me. So even if the end isn't near or, or even if it's not within my lifetime, I want to be the one who says, as for me and my family, we will serve the Lord. I am going to live my life on fire for him. It is going to be laid down at the altar and say, God, breathe breath into this life that you've given me and use it as you see fit. And the legacy that I want to leave is a legacy for my children and their children and their children's children and so on and so forth. And from here forward, the Carters are going to be serving Jesus. Do you feel me? So there is this sense of urgency. There is this importance of how we live our lives. I can't wait till Monday. I can't wait for another new year resolution. I don't know how many breaths God has breathed into my lungs. I don't know how many days I have left. It is flippant. It is selfish. It is short-sighted. And, 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 and it's, it's crazy for us to think that this life is about us, that it revolves around us. Maybe my great, great, great grandchild is the one who starts a worldwide revival. 
And the enemy is attacking me to try to get me off track in order to let that trickle down. So now there is a cycle of hurt and pain and immorality and violence and addiction so that when it gets to my great, great grandchild who was set and called to be the great revivalist. So by the time that it gets to them, they're so surrounded by brokenness and trauma and hurt and pain that they can never see past their own suffering and circumstances to walk in the fullness of what God's called them to. And so many of us are in that place where it might not even be about you. It might just be about those who come from you. But you're so focused on the here and the now and you and your suffering and your pain and your trauma and the things that you've gone through and somebody hurts you and somebody stabbed you in the back. You can't see past that. When we start to look at life through the lens of Jesus, when we start to look at his suffering, his story, when we start to notice it and we start to understand and realize that it's not about us, it's so much greater. That's when we start to really truly live life. We are in the middle of the last days and it is of the utmost importance that we start to fight for our faith. We put our feet down, uh, our nose to the grindstone and we start living like today is the last day that we got I understand that our salvation isn't hanging in the balance, right? We're not saved by our works, but man, what are we doing with the salvation that we've been gifted? That's the message. What are we doing with the salvation? You have been given the gift of eternal life for free. You didn't do anything to earn it. You didn't deserve it. It was a gift. You were chosen to handle this divine privilege, to have a divine revelation of who Jesus was. And what do we do with it? We acted, we, we, we act so flippant about it, right? It's not like your grandma gave you a, a, a Christmas gift of socks and you're just like, oh, thanks grandma socks. And you just kind of throw it. Where's the Nintendo? No, like the gift of salvation. We've been given to it. And some of us are like, oh, thanks Jesus. Awesome salvation. Hey, but anyway, you know, eternity sounds great, but like, can we just fix what I'm going through right now? Can we just fix my suffering and discouragement? And he's like, but did you not just see the gift I gave you? The gift of salvation, eternal salvation? That should be filled with joy. The gift that I just gave you should be enough. The gift that I just gave you should change everything in your life, your perspective, your mindset, your heart posture. Did you not, do you not understand the gift that was just given to you? The gift that was given to you should surpass all of your earthly struggles and grief and trauma and the things that you're dealing with. And if you're not in that place, this isn't me for me to condemn you. But what I'm trying to show you is a piece of the peace that you're going to receive when you start to understand what it is that you've been given. Right? I'm, I'm excited about this, man. There's this, there's this joy that's just shut up in my bones because it's like, man, when you start to know him and you start to walk with him and there's this fellowship, it, the, the stuff in this world, because we're just passing through, it matters a lot less. It doesn't mean that there's not causes and things that I stand for. It doesn't mean that I'm not out here making a difference, but the, 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 the hurt, the pain, the tragedy, the trauma, the, all of the suffering, the things that most of us are, are, are sitting in, most of, the thing, most of the things that many of us are exalting uh, above his story, those things start to matter less. And all I want to do now is live a life on fire for him, man. I want to live a life on fire for Jesus. I want to lay my life down at the altar. Lord, it's yours. Do with it as you see fit. Do with it as you please. And when we get to that place, this place that I'm trying to take us, I'm trying to encourage you guys to get to this same place. When you start to live like that, things start to look different. When we put him first, when we start living for him, when we understand that it's not about us. He gives us exceedingly and abundantly more and greater than we could ever possibly imagine or think of. And many of us equate that to here on this earth, but it's so much greater than the things here on this earth. It's this transformation that occurs inside. It's these spiritual giftings, this wisdom, this knowledge, this understanding, this perspective that transforms. Oh, Lord Jesus, help me help others, help me lead by example. God, help me help others to see the same thing. I want people on fire with me running in the same direction. Like, come on, man. Whoo, I get excited about it because I just, he's real. 
<laughs> he's real. It's real. It's it's serious. Our salvation, it's it's not something to just be taken lightly. I, I could sit here and I could give you guys a list of all the bad stuff that's happening in my life. Well, last night at the, the basketball game, uh, you know, I got a text message from Kyra. She's at home racking her brain because um, her card has experienced some uh, identity theft. Thousands of dollars have been taken from our account. Uh, from around, I, we don't know how, we don't know when, but there's all these fraudulent charges and, uh, you know, our bank account, pff, bad, it's down bad right now. I can sit here worrying about it, crying about it, boohooing about it, frustrated about it. But at the end of the day, you know, the money will be restored. Uh, the person's going to get caught. God's going to have the victory. Um, you know, I, I have everything that I need today. The rent's paid for the month. Like, I could sit here and, and play the victim card. And I could sit here and complain to you guys about that. And, and, and talk to you guys about, all you know, all of that stuff. But at the end of the day, man, it's just like, why? I'm not a victim. Because if I breathe my last breath, the last thing that I want to be overly consumed with is the identity theft. It's a distraction. It's, it's something that it's, it's something that is trying to steal my peace. It's something that's trying to steal my joy. And many of us allow those kinds of things and life events and tragedy and inconveniences to steal our joy and to pull our focus and attention off of him. Right. If I woke up and I was just like, man, that sucks. And, uh, you know, if I were to come here and be like, you know what, guys, we're not going to do coffee and prayer today because, you know, we're dealing with some stuff with the bank and with the law and all of these things we're trying to get handled. And I'm just really stressed out and I'm tired. and I didn't sleep very good. And I start feeding myself this line of excuses. I start to believe this. And you guys wouldn't have been mad. You'd be like, oh, no, Andrew, we understand. And gosh, man, you know, we'll be praying for you. Get some rest. Get some help. We just hope everything works out. And then we don't have coffee coffee and prayer today. No, man, I'm not going to allow my feelings, my emotions, my circumstances, the things that I'm dealing with in my life. I'm not going to allow those to dictate my actions. I understand that today might be the last day that I breathe breath. I could be in an accident on my way to play some ball this morning and be done for. I don't want to spend my last moments because there's a sense of urgency, belly aching and complaining about something that's out of my control. You know what I can control? I can control showing up here. I can control being filled with the Holy Spirit. I can I can control setting you guys on fire and sending you out into the world to make a difference for Jesus. You know what I mean? That's why I, I, I just, I, I just, oh, thank you. Just as I know him, I know my purpose and all of this other stuff matters less, right? It matters less. You ain't going to steal my joy. You're not going to steal my peace, my happiness. Now, am I going to be scared to use my card? No. Am I going to be scared to use my card? I like, and, and that's what happens. And now people will help. Now I'm going to start living in fear and tiptoeing and I got to be more careful. We're careful. We have double authentication factors. We've got all the password stuff changes. The sad fact of the matter, there's crafty and evil people out there. And we travel a lot and use our card in a lot of places. And somebody might have used a card. Like, we don't know. We can't even boil it down because the charges are in Minnesota, Wisconsin, New York, Florida. The charges are all around the nation. And we're just like, how did this even happen? We have no idea. So, but am I going to be lived in fear? Am I going to allow my feelings and my emotions to dictate my actions? And now I'm just going to only go to cash. And now everywhere I'm going, I'm just going to pay in cash and keep this ledger. Because... No, man, I don't have that kind of time, energy, or effort. If I'm breathing my last breath, the last thing I want to be concerned or overly focused on is the corruption of the system and the scammers and the fraud and the, all of that stuff that's going on out there. No, man, God's got the victory. No weapon formed against me is going to prosper. Right. And maybe these people really needed the money. Maybe they needed to put some food on the table. I don't know the circumstances. Right. I don't know. The last thing I'm going to say about this. Mm, he says this in verse 20. Use use your most holy faith to build yourselves up, praying in the Holy Spirit. Keep yourselves in God's loves as you wait. For the Lord Jesus Christ with his mercy to give you life forever, man. Pray in the spirit. Keep yourself in God's love. Verse 22, show mercy to some people who have doubts. Take others out of the fire and save them. Show mercy mixed with fear to others 
hating even the, the their clothes, which are dirty from sin. It says uh, in, in verse 24, God is strong and can help you not to fall. He can bring you before his glory without any wrong in you and can give uh, and can give you great joy. He is the only God, the one who saves us. I have a great joy because of my salvation, a joy that's unshakable, a, a joy that is unmatched. Am I constantly joyous? No. Does bad stuff happen? Absolutely. Do I get frustrated? Of course. Do I have feelings and emotions? 100%. But my salvation supersedes my situations. Let me say that again, because that's a tweet too. Regardless of what I'm going through, regardless of the storms, my salvation, the joy of my salvation, it supersedes my situations. It's greater than the things that I'm going through. So even though I might go through something in the moment, I might feel a certain way. But at the end of the day, the joy of my salvation is far greater than the things that are coming against me. Amen. That's good. Verse 22, I, I like this because um, check this out. I'm going to, oh, I dropped it. Let me get that. Sorry, guys. Just headbutt the phone, drop my devotional. I want to read Jude real quick out of a different translation. Let me bookmark this. I'm going to, I, I just want to read it out of uh, the New King James Version real quick. Hold tight. Where's it at? There's Revelation. There's Jude. One book. Bam. In verse 22, this is the New King James Version. It says this. And this is talking about saving souls, right? It says, On some have compassion, making a distinction, but others save with fear, pulling them out of the fire, hating the, even the garment defiled by the flesh. On some have compassion, others save with fear. I like this verse, and I go to this verse often because when I first started ministry, um, you get Christians, well-meaning Christians, and they're in the they're in the comment section. Repent. You talk about repentance, right? And this is this is the this is the voice in the mind. I feel like they got a vein, and they're just like, repent. Why don't you preach about repentance? Their fists are balled up. We're we're, we're speaking with love. You got to judge your brothers righteously. All right, these are the same people who are like pushing people away from Christianity because they sit on these holy high horses and they scream repentance and they got a vein popping out of their neck and they've got sandwich boards and blow horns and they're screaming, you're going to burn in hell. Like they're so intense and it's like, bro, there's a lot of grace. There's a lot of love. There's a lot of space for maturity. Like, you know, Jesus is love and truth without love. Truth is just a clanging symbol. Like they're missing a big part of scripture, but all they heard was repent and be baptized. And so that's like their whole doctrine is repentance and they're losing their mind, man. But it says with some have compassion with others, use fear. With some, you've got to be gentle and soft and compassionate. You've got to be patient because some people are hard-headed or some people are sensitive. But then some actually need that. So your whole doctrine and the whole way that you approach each sinner is different. I've got three kids. I could not discipline my kids the same way, right? I have three kids. My oldest son, if, if I spanked this kid, you would, you would have thought that he was being abused. It, before I could even get a hand on him, he's, ah, 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 and I'm standing there like, dude, I, ha I literally haven't even touched you. You just know you're about to be disciplined and you, 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 you like turn around and you he turns around and he's like, and I'm like, I haven't even wound up. I, I literally haven't even spanked you. And he's ah, 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 freaking out. And then you give him a spanking and you would have thought you would have thought that you dropped a grenade on the kid. Ah, just a full dramatic show. It's crazy. I'm like, wait a second. This is the most ridiculous thing I've ever seen. You're, you're barely getting spanked. I would, I would have to hold myself from laughing. I know that doesn't sound like good parenting, right? So you're telling me you corporally punish your kid. You physically discipline him. And, and in the midst of his terror, you were laughing. I was laughing because he deserved an Oscar or an Emmy. If we had neighbors, they'd probably be like, man, they're beating that kid. And I'm like, I haven't even touched him. I haven't even spanked the guy. It's crazy. My second son, Ezra, he was straight faced. This kid would, I'd be like, all right, it's time to get a spanking. And he would walk, you know, militantly and he would receive his spanking. He'd be like, thank you, father, for the discipline. Not even like, and one like solo tear, it would be like straight face. And it's like, you're not going to cry. And he's like, absolutely not. And I received my discipline. And I'm just like, this is, this guy's weird, man. Like this isn't, that's not healthy. Like 
that's not good. That concerns me. But if you raised your voice at him, if you said, hey, don't touch that, he'd start, oh, he would he would crumble under a loud voice, but he could receive physical discipline. My other son, my oldest son, you could yell at him until you're blue in the face. It wouldn't, it wouldn't make him mad. I'd be like, don't touch that. And he'd look at you. Don't touch that. Don't touch that. Don't touch that. What would he do? Ah, he'd touch it. And you're like, dude, I said not to touch it. And he's like, eh, I touched it. I could not discipline. And, and my third son, he was perfect. So I didn't have to discipline him. He watched his brothers. Uh, his discipline is more of like, I have to take stuff. I didn't have to spank him a lot because he learned from uh, observation. He's seen, he's like, oh, okay. If I do that, I'm going to be disciplined. Oh, if I do, oh, 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 okay. Let me take this in. Let me be a little bit more smarter and crafty. And let me be super cute so that my parents love me and they're not going to discipline me as much. And so for him, now I got, I, I'm more of like, I got to take stuff from you. Oh, you like to do that? Let me take that privilege away from you. And don't get me wrong. I've had to give him physical discipline. Um, and, and he's kind of somewhere right in the middle uh, and it would break my heart. But, <laughs> but my point is this, everybody learns differently and you have to interact with individuals differently. So there's not one way black and white to save a soul or to save or minister to a sinner. You guys understand that? And Jude chapter or Jude verse 20 uh, or, or, or was it 22 is very explicit. With some use compassion, with others use fear. Know the distinction, have an idea, know your audience. Sometimes that hard stance of repent or go to hell, that's gonna be like, yeah, dude, I don't want any of that. You're too intense, I'm out of here. I'm running from Jesus. And then some people is like, you're being too soft and too gentle. And you're just like, oh, there's grace. And they're out there just completely abusing the grace. They're just like, oh, there's grace? Oh, well, I can do whatever I want. If God forgives me, let me just go out here and live my life. And then I'll, there are, you know, then I'll, because of the blood of Jesus, I'm saved. There has to be discernment. There has to be distinction. And when you're ministering, you have to know your audience, know who you're dealing with, know what works. And, and, and it might have to be a mixture. It might be trial and error, but understand as you are in this battlefield fighting for souls and fighting for position and planting seeds and watering individuals and discipling individuals, know who you're dealing with and how you're dealing with them. Amen. With some use compassion, with others use fear. For some people, man, the sandwich board megaphone guy is exactly what they need, right? They, they need to be confronted with the truth of an eternity separated from God. And then with others, there might, you have to, you might have to be super gentle. You might not be able to raise your voice or, or to come in too strong or too hard. You might have to go heavy grace in order to get them to understand who they are and whose they are. And you might have to nurture them in a manner that helps them have better, have a better understanding of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Hey, Genesis chapter 43, I'm going to be very brief because we have literally one minute. This is going to be the fast forwarded version. Again, um, we understand that Joseph uh, sent his brothers back from Pharaoh's place. They got back home. They were down a brother. Dad's like, where's the other son? They said, hey, the guy wants us to bring Benjamin back. Um, and he goes, on top of this, he gave us food and our money's still in our bag. And so dad's like, okay, you're not taking Benjamin. Everything's good. So time goes by, they run out of food. They need to go see this guy again. And they go, and Judah's like, look, dad, if we go back, we got to take Benjamin with us. Benjamin's your youngest son. He's got to go. That's what the man said. If we don't go back with Benjamin, not only do we not get our other guy, our other brother back, who they've kind of written off at this point, they're just like, ah, he's a lost cause. But Benjamin is like dad's next favorite. Joseph was the one. Now Benjamin's the next He's like, no, you're not going. So they finally convinced dad, look, they put everything on the line. We're going to take Benjamin. We're going to get it. And, um, you know, we're going to, we're going to address the guy. So up to this point, as you guys read chapter 43 is Joseph's brothers return. This time they've got Benjamin in hand. They're super scared. They're nervous. They don't know what they're walking into. Um, but again, what they walk into is Joseph is just like, he's moved with emotion, Right now he sees his family. He sees his brothers. He's been away from them for so long. He is a man of God. He's got integrity. He's not hard hearted. He even has to remove himself again when he sees Benjamin, his brother, because that's his brother from the same mother. He sees his brother and he's like, he's got to remove himself. He goes off into his chamber. He weeps. He's got to wash his face because he's got tear stains and he comes back and he's trying to keep it together. Right. He's putting on this facade. He's putting on, you know, this tough face. He's like, this is who I am now. I'm Joseph, the second hand, the right man to Pharaoh. 
and, and he's sitting there in the presence of his brothers and like he sets him up a feast. He kills the fatted calf. He uh, He's doing his thing. He even gives Benjamin the greatest portion. He sets them and lines them up in order of like importance from the youngest brother to the oldest brother. They even bring in the brother who got locked up. He's there now. And that's where we leave off in chapter 43. I promise tomorrow we'll spend a little bit more time in 44 breaking things down as we start the book of Revelation. But I want to say a prayer as we get out of here. Thank you guys for um, no altar call today at the end of Jude. Uh, we're not going to do a digital altar call. We just did one, a chapter two days ago. Um, and because we did John 2 and 2nd John and 3rd John and then Jude, we will wait until the end of Revelation. So this is a great time to bring your friends, your family members, your loved ones in. Um, it's going to be good. I'm excited. Okay. I'm excited. So um, let's pray. Heavenly Father, we just thank you for your word. We thank you for your truth. We thank you for your love, your mercy, and grace. As we leave this place, God, we've got so much to think about, so many things that you've spoke to us. Help us just to sit in it. Lord, we know that your word doesn't return void. Speak to us, lead us, guide us, teach us, and help us to be more like your son, Jesus. Lord, we love you. We honor you and we thank you for all that you do, for who you are. God, help us to see the direction, the way, and the flow on which you want us to live this life. Now, we want nothing but your will. That's what we truly want because we know that's what we were made for. We love you and we pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen and amen. Hope you guys have an amazing day and I will see you back here tomorrow where we jump into Genesis 44 and we start a brand new book, the final book of the New Testament, Revelation um, yeah. So bring your coffee, bring your tea, uh, but don't be late because we'll be here ready to rock. You guys have a good one.